2018 Ibrahim Index of African Governance shows that public governance in Africa is lagging behind the needs and expectations of a growing population comprising more of the youth. According to the report, sustainable economic opportunities only went up by 0.1 point since 2008, representing the worst performing and slowest improving category of the index. Channel Television's business correspondent, Tempo Ashaju, examines the position of Nigeria in the reading. The Ibrahim Index of African Governance is a tool that measures and monitors leadership performance in African countries. The latest of the reading was recently launched by the Mo Ibrahim Foundation with resources drawn from various research firms. In making the 10-year assessment for the continent, some dimensions were explored, including sustainable economic opportunity, participation and human rights, transparency and accountability, as well as safety and the rule of law. The index shows that Nigeria is rated 33rd out of 54 African countries, indicating slow progress in welfare and social protection, while education is tragically on the decline, with millions of children of school age who are out of school. Other low points in the report are poor nutrition and joblessness as population growth worsens its human development indices. Talk about resource allocation or, you know, you go to places in Lagos, for instance, you see abandoned buildings. How did it become that way? You see resources that are just being wasted as it were, you know. So all of these are things that could be turned around if we actually embraced lean, you know, to say, okay, you know what, let's take a look at our processes. How can we eliminate waste? Despite Nigeria's poor overall ranking, the country is noted to have recorded remarkable improvements in gender equality in the workplace. The Ibrahim Index of African Governance comes with a $5 million reward for an African ex-head of state, one that a Nigerian is yet to receive. Temple Ashaju, Channel Television News. Now let's get more perspective on this report by the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. And I'm now being joined on the News at 10 by an economist and director, Center for Infrastructure, Policy Regulation and Advancement of the Lagos Business School, Dr. Bongo Adi. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Now what's your impression of this report, especially as it relates to Nigeria? Well, I don't think it, uh, it gives any uh, startling, uh, surprising you know, thing because uh, we've known it. Um, it's often been said uh, lately that the population is growing faster than the, the economy. So what it means is that um, uh, the growth is not able to take care of the you know, additional number of people. And moreover, we have come to what, what economics regard as the demographic uh, transition in Africa, especially in Nigeria, where you have a disproportionately number of uh, very young people. Uh, we understand that uh, you know, the average uh, age of Nigerian population right now is about 16 years. So what it means is that you have a very large uh, people you know, in the very young uh, cohort. So, but um, from all indications, uh, government is not providing for them, and that is actually attributable to a failure of uh, governance. Um, we haven't seen any serious commitment, especially in Nigeria. Some other African countries like Rwanda, South Africa, uh, Mauritius, uh, even the Niger Republic uh, are performing better than Nigeria, you know, especially in that particular aspect, which is sustainable economic opportunity. Now, when we look around in, in, in Africa generally, but Nigeria especially, you know, urbanization is occurring at a very high rate, okay? Um, uh, the uh, UN, uh, UN Habitat, you know, reports that uh, in the next 30 years, we're going to have more people living in urban areas in, in Africa more than other parts of the world. Now, what it means is that without providing for all these people, we have an increasing rate of informality. And that now, brings me to my next question, yes. if I may come in. Welfare and social protection, which this government has been praised for, got knocks, ironically. So would you say this assessment really reflects the reality on the ground, especially Nigeria's reality? Well, I, 
I think it does capture the, the situation on ground. Why do you say that? Why I say that is that uh, we have to go beyond the rhetoric that we keep getting from the government and then uh, analyze and uh, interrogate the facts on the ground. So I was talking about the high level of informality in Nigeria. Now, currently, 93% or 95% of new jobs okay, are created by the informal, informal economy. Okay? And then uh, the, the economy itself is about 75% informal. So when we talk about um, jobs and employment and then uh, income growth, per capita income growth, there is no way you can disconnect it or divorce it from um, you know, opportunities that are, arise. Now, let's look at, again, I was just talking about the demographic transition. There is another one, which is the structural transition. Now, economies come out from agriculture, from agra agrarian way of uh, life, agrarian livelihood. They move into manufacturing, and then when they get into manufacturing, they get linked into the global value chain before they get into services. But what we have in, much of, in most of developing countries in Africa, especially in Nigeria, is a direct transition from agriculture to services. So we have uh, an economy, an informal economic sector that is dominated by just services that are not linked into the global value chain, meaning that we are not exporting our services. Because we are not exporting those services, we are not earning income on that. And that cannot lead to the growth um, of income for the average uh, Nigerian. So people are not uh, you know, get generating what economists call the urbanization dividend. That is not happening as a result of a lack of integration into the global value chain. Again, all these things because of the uh, way uh, that governance has happened. There has not been any consensus um, effort to drive the economy, especially to get the agricultural uh, uh, dimension to move into into manufacturing, so where what we can we get links. For the manufacturing, of course, sector. manufacturing leverages strongly infrastructure which we do not have so uh, actually this government gov uh, the government of the day uh, is always praising itself on the social investment they've made but social investment is just investment on the air if there is no concrete investment on physical infrastructure because that is what actually drives growth now let's talk about participation and human rights has nigeria really performed so badly of course, you can see what has happened, especially over the uh, last uh, three years, actually. Some people feel that uh, with um, the turn of events, um, uh, Nigeria is descending into what they call a fascist system, where we have draconian executive orders that limit uh, freedoms and limit people's rights. Of course, that will reflect in the report, and I think it has happened. And beyond that, we've seen companies moving away from Nigeria because of a harsh uh, business environment. We've seen what has uh, been happening to MTN, which has been the poster child for private sector-led growth over the years. I remember when uh, the policymakers used to travel abroad, and they will always be citing the example of MTN. But today, MTN has come under um, heat uh, from the government. So that is not sending the right signals to the foreign investors. So uh, HSBC Bank and uh, UBS uh, have left, okay? Uh, those are also very bad indicators regarding the, uh, the business environment. But instead of just waiting for the government to fix things, what about individuals? Because a lot of people can now, just sit down the sidelines and system. criticize, but why not join the government to it's try and fix It's not a matter of uh, criticizing the government. Uh, there is little individuals can do in a state such as uh, in Nigeria. Um, this is a very static, uh, statist system. Statist in the sense that um, there is uh, over-concentration of power in, in the government. So even for the private sector, it is difficult. In fact, the private sector that we have in Nigeria, uh, most of them are rent seekers. Without uh, getting special con concessions from the government, they can't just operate. So it means that the government runs the system, even at that. So there is little liberalization, there is little deregulation of the system, so to speak. So there is little any individual can do, except when the government begins. And when we talk of restructuring, it's not just about political restructuring. The economic restructuring has to happen. Now let's conclude by looking at the area that Nigeria fared well, which is 
equal opportunity in the workplace. Now, how significant is this in terms of governance ratings? Well, equal opportunity in the workplace, you're talking about gender yes. equality. Of course, you know, um, given the impetus of previous administration, okay, regarding girl-child um, education, it's unfortunate what has happened, you know, in Benue, the little girl that's been buried today. Um, that's a very bad one. But regardless of that, I think Nigeria has made remarkable, remarkable progress when it comes to girl-child education and gender equality. So that will reflect, but again, when it comes to uh, economic opportunity, I don't think that such uh, indicators count so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bongo Adi, an economist and the director for infrastructure at the Policy Regulation and Advancement of the Lagos Business School for speaking with us on the News at 10. Thank you very much. Now let's move over to some business stories and Anne is standing by with those details. Thanks a lot, Melinda. Let's begin business news tonight with a report coming from the Central Bank of Nigeria. It shows that two global giant banks, HSBC and UBS, have closed their respective offices and shut down operations in Nigeria. And this is coming as the CBN hints that foreign direct investment has fallen sharply from a year ago, with the FDI down to 379.84 billion naira in the first half of this year. And that's from 532.6, which it was earlier. Although the financial market regulator did not give reasons for the shutdown, it is public knowledge that UK bank HSBC had been at loggerheads with the federal government lately. In the meantime, Equifax Bank says that the outlook for the Nigerian economy in the second half is optimistic given the increase in global oil prices and production. Now let's talk about trading activities at the Nigerian stock market. It has ended the week in the red as profit taken by investors outweighed the moderate gains recorded in five sessions. The all share index and the equities capitalization both dipped by 2.38% to close the week at 332,124.9 and 11.728 trillion naira, respectively, while the, all the five key sub indices also ended negative. At the same time, investors' appetite for stocks were lower with a total of 1.26 billion shares traded in 15,088 transactions, in contrast to a total of 1.45 billion shares traded in 16,682 deals last week. In price performance, Presco emerged best among 18 gainers. Unity Bank is worst performer among 50 losers, while 111, 101 equities remained unchanged this week. And to Nigeria's local currency, the Naira, it has maintained stability at the parallel market as it exchanged at 360.5 to the dollar, 480 against the bat pound sterling, and 418 to the euro on Friday. But at the Bureau de Change window, the Naira closed at 360 to the dollar, while it closed at 480 pounds sterling and 418 against the euro. At the investors' window, the Naira was sold at 363.74 to the dollar, while it closed at 306.6 to at the official window of the central bank. But on Tuesday this week, the CBN continued its intervention at the Forex market with a sum of $210 million for various segments, all to ensure the stability of the Naira. And outside Nigeria, Kenya's mobile telecoms operator Safaricom has posted a rise of 7.7% for the first half of this year and driven by growth in its mobile financial services and data. The company, partly owned by South Africa's Vodacom and Britain's Vodafone, says its earnings before interest tax in the first half of this year has jumped 18.7%, which resulted in a 22% increase in its earnings per share. The telecoms firm says that revenue from its popular N-Pesa mobile money service jumped 18.2% to 35.52 billion Kenyan shillings. That's business news for this week. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu. It's back to you, Melina. Many thanks, Anne. Still ahead on the news at 10. Novak Djokovic beat Roger Federer in three thrilling sets to reach the final of the Paris Masters. That's some sports news. Stay with us.